training period just to read through it. It's so long. But it's uh, she's a certified specialist in the area of legal malpractice law. She is a member and section chair of the United States District Court Central District Standing Committee on Discipline. And she has published extensively. You can see the, her list of publications on the CD. Ann Martindale Hubble has rated her um, AV preeminent rating. The law firm is also preeminent rated by Martindale Hubble. She's repeatedly been selected as one of the top 50 women lawyers in Southern California. And <clears throat> she's also in the top 100 lawyers in Southern California. So it's really, she's doing this pro bono. She does a lot of pro bono work and I really appreciate her being here today. These hypos came from Tim. I sent out some requests for hypotheticals that were related just to dependency issues. And so she's given us now a, a nice outline of those issues and how we should attempt to solve these dilemmas when we encounter them. Okay? Ellen Pansky, thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. It's, you know, not so huge of a group that we can't um, take questions and have more of a discussion format. So as I go, if there's something that you want to talk about or that you feel um, maybe is a, an ethical issue for you or a dilemma that you're facing now, please feel free to raise your hand because I really want to be responsive to your issues. Um, some of the issues that, that were presented in, in the hypos have kind of a common theme, um, which relate to your duties, which may be thought of as conflicting duties to the, your client, because as you know, every lawyer has a duty of loyalty to all of their existing clients, but you also have a duty to the court. In some instances, you also have a duty to other parties, like e even opposing counsel uh, in certain instances, and I want to talk about that as well. But oftentimes, we as lawyers are on the horns of a dilemma <coughs> because we have a duty to maintain our client confidences and to be loyal to our clients. But if, on the other hand, your client is telling you or you have a reasonable basis to suspect that the, the client is being deceptive, even if the client hasn't stated that to you or hasn't admitted it to you, then you also have a competing duty of candor to the court. So let's move, for, for example, um, into the situation where the client says to you, um, if you put me on the stand, I'm going to lie. Um, I'm going to, I know what the ramifications are, and I know it's going to hurt my case to tell the truth. So when I get on the stand, I'm going to lie. You are ethically precluded from suborning perjury. So you may not put a client on the stand knowing that the client is going to lie. It's very clear. Now, there is an exception to that, which may or may not apply to your area of law. And that is, for example, in uh, criminal defense matters. It has developed because of the special level of proof that's owed in a criminal proceeding and the due process right to counsel, that if a lawyer is concerned that a criminal defendant is going to lie, um, and or if the lawyer believes that not knowing in advance that the client was going to lie, but while on the stand testifying, the lawyer recognizes that the client has lied, it is not an ethical breach for the criminal defense lawyer to put the client on the stand and allow that client to testify in a narrative. So the lawyer is not asking questions eliciting perjurious testimony, but at the same time, if the criminal defendant elects to testify in their own defense, then they are allowed to do so by way of a narrative. Um, I'm not aware of any cases, and I haven't researched whether that would apply in dependency hearings or other hearings, um, but if you're faced with a situation, particularly one where you don't know in advance, your client has taken the stand and has committed perjury, um, you, you know, that may, that may be an issue that you want to pursue. When the client advises you, for example, of a past bad act or illegal act, that is covered by attorney-client privilege. Because unlike the situation where the client is coming to you to seek advice or representation to commit a crime or fraud, 
which perjury clearly is, now you have the client telling you of something that happened in the past. What do you do when the client says, I gave you documents, or I filled out a form, or I provided a statement, or I testified under penalty of perjury in the past, and th those were false statements? Now you have a different situation, because the attorney-client privilege protects, strictly protects, past conduct. Unless the client's coming you, to you to, in a continuing crime or fraud situation, seeking your advice to aid them in a continuing or future crime or fraud, past acts are strictly covered by the privilege. So you would not have an obligation to withdraw from representation or to reveal this information <coughs> that your client gave you in confidence because there is no continuing crime or fraud you're not being asked to assist the client in that regard. Consequently, if you are in the situation, it's important for you to take a step back, assuming you're not in the courtroom and this is something that's happening at that moment, and you know, try to carefully analyze, maybe get some assistance from colleagues, supervisors, or if need be, call a legal ethicist to analyze, is this something that you can maintain in strict confidentiality, or is this situation now putting you in an, an untenable conflict where you cannot continue to represent the client without being dishonest or lacking in candor to the tribunal? And if you decide that it's a past act, it may not require you uh, to do anything except, of course, not to aid your client to commit future <coughs> perjurious statements or future bad acts. The case law has developed to say that if your client, and this happens in civil cases all the time, where, for example, in deposition, a client testifies untruthfully, what does the, what does the lawyer do? What the lawyer is supposed to do is call a recess, consult with the client, urge the client to correct the misstatement or the fraudulent statement, and then the lawyer can continue to provide representation. If the client refuses to do so, and by allowing the client to continue, the lawyer is going to aid and abet the client in making perjurious statements, then the lawyer is supposed to withdraw from representation. In withdrawing from representation, the lawyer is not to reveal anything more than is absolutely necessary. So again, assuming that your client has committed perjury, let's just call it perjury, false <laughs> statement, whatever it is, um, and now you know you're going to have to withdraw because if you continue, you're going to assist them to continue in this uh, false statement. You cannot make what's called a noisy withdrawal. You're supposed to protect the client to the extent possible so that you don't alert opposing counsel to the fact that the client has made a false statement and you don't prejudice the client in front of the court. And that's why, for example, if you look at the judicial counsel form, for withdrawal of representation or for the court to give you an order permitting you to withdraw, uh, it allows you to provide this um, motion without referring specifically to the grounds that, are, that form the basis of the motion. If you think that the court is not going to allow you to withdraw without providing a declaration or without giving some information as to what the conflict is that's requiring you to withdraw, the way to do that would be to prepare a declaration under seal, request the court's permission to file it under seal so that you're not providing this harmful information about your own client to the opposing lawyer or the opposing party. What I sometimes uh, do, and especially if you're in a case where you know if the judge is going to hear this information, it's going to prejudice the client in front of the judge, is request that the judge refer out the motion to someone other than trial counsel to rule on the motion and explain to the court you don't want to run the risk that you do anything which is going to jeopardize the client's position in front of this court. And so, you know, in, in um, fairness to the client and in order not to prejudice the client's interests, request that some other judge hear the motion. We had a question. Um, yes, I'm sorry. What should we do in instances um, where we've gone through um, all of this and there is a conflict and we 
filed um, to be relieved. It's been denied. We've even had to give a sealed declaration, and we're still on the case. Um, how should we proceed? Because there are bench officers that will not relieve you. Well, I think, you know, obviously then you're between the proverbial rock and a hard place because if the court's not letting you out, I mean, unless you have the ability to take a writ, um, and I, you know, I don't know whether you often do that, but you know, what you can do is you can ask the court for a brief continuance to present, to provide you with an opportunity to file the writ and explain to the court that you are being placed in an untenable conflict between your duty to the client and you know, your duties um, to the court and therefore, you have, you know, be very respectful, but, you know, try to explain to the court you have no option. If the court won't allow you to do that, then unfortunately, you really do have a dilemma. You know, when I was in law school, we were told sometimes you have to bring your toothbrush. <laughs> and, you know, if the court says to you, I'm, I'll hold you in contempt if you don't, you know, proceed, counsel. We're not going to take a, you know, a break, or I'm not going to continue the matter. You will proceed. You really have only two options. You can acquiesce, or you can say, you know, with all due respect, Your Honor, I'm not ethically permitted to do that, and I must respectfully tell, you, tell the court that I cannot proceed at this time. And if the court holds you in contempt, then, you know, obviously you're going to have to <coughs> address that. At a minimum, call your supervisor, get another lawyer down in the courtroom to represent you as soon as possible. <laughs> Um, but really, those are your only two options. They're not, you know, not the best options, but that's that's all you can do. Um, but let me say that, you know, I do a lot of state bar defense, and for the most part, if a lawyer is complying with a court's order and you make a record, and the record shows that you did your best to persuade the judge to allow you to at least take it up on appeal um, or go back and, and brief, brief it more fully or get another lawyer to come in and independently, independently represent you on this issue, it's really unlikely that you're gonna be disciplined. You know, the state bar is not, um, you know, generally there to punish lawyers, and if you can show that you made a good faith effort to comply with all of your ethical and professional responsibilities, the chances of you getting disciplined is, are very low. Um, Yes, the next question is, what happens if the client tells the lawyer that she's intending to bring a <coughs> hidden tape recorder to TDM and give the results to the lawyer to use in court? This is, you know, secretly taping um, a conversation is generally considered to be improper um, under the penal code if you secretly tape and electronic communication, it's a crime. Um, so at that point, your first duty is to advise the <coughs> client of the adverse consequences of undertaking this action. Usually, as a practical matter, once you advise the client um, that this kind of conduct could subject them to criminal charges, they will rethink and will agree not to do so. Again, your job at that point is to advise the client. Let me digress for a second and just talk generally about that. There's um, some debate in the legal ethics community about how far your duty goes when you've been retained to represent the client in a specific manner. You know, you've limited the scope of representation, you've made it clear or it's clear by the context, you are only representing the client in this <coughs> proceeding on these issues. But sometimes issues arise that are tangential to the matter that you represent the client on, but you may or should recognize that these other legal issues are present and the client may need advice on those issues. Again, they may be outside of your area of expertise. There are cases which say, one being a case called Nichols versus Keller, where, for example, the client hired the lawyer for a workers' comp action only. The lawyer exclusively practiced in workers' comp, did not do third-party PI cases, and did not advise the client that in addition to the workers' comp claim, the, the client might have a third-party uh, personal injury case. 
And I think that under the case, the, stat, the statute ran because the client had no idea about this. So the client sues the workers' comp lawyer for malpractice, and the lawyer says in the, his defense, I was never hired to represent this client on the PI case. I had no duty to this client, therefore I couldn't, couldn't possibly be held liable for malpractice. And the court said, wrong. Any reasonable lawyer practicing in this area <laughs> should know that this client has a separate third party claim in addition to the workers' comp claim. The court said, you don't have to represent the client in this claim, workers' comp lawyer, but at a minimum, you have a duty to tell the client, go see another lawyer because you may have a third party PI claim. And the failure to have advised the client to do so gave rise to the legal malpractice claim. So in your situation, as here, even if you are not specifically advising the client on this tangential or ancillary legal issue, at a minimum, if you recognize it, you should say to the client, I'm not representing you in this other area. I'm not a criminal defense lawyer, but I must advise you of the fact that if you tape this uh, meeting or this hearing or this conversation, you could be subjecting yourself to criminal char charges. And if you are, cons well, I should say, whether or not you're concerned that the client's going to follow that advice, you should make a record somewhere, whether it's in your, your chart notes, um, in your communication with the client, email, make a record of the fact that this issue arose and you advise the client. Because later, if the client disregards your advice and undertakes the action, you don't want to be at jeopardy if the client says, um, I told my lawyer about this, my lawyer didn't tell me there was anything wrong, or worse, and this does happen where the client says, oh, I talked to my lawyer about this and they said it was fine, go ahead and do it. And if you don't have any record of the fact that you told them not to do it, it's your word against the clients. And again, in talking about state bar complaints, the, it, the state bar tends to believe the complainant, the client. And they tend to put, even though the burden of proof is on the state bar to discipline the lawyer, when it comes to the investigation level of the state bar complaint, if you can't demonstrate that you did fulfill your ethical duties, you're at greater risk that the state bar is going to take that matter further and maybe even file a disciplinary <coughs> case against you. Any more questions on this hypo? All right, we have a lot of hypos, so I'm going to move along. Oh, yes. It's Kind of touches a little bit. Um, I just had a question in regards to like a conflict issue. Um, I know myself. Um, there's been a couple of times where I've been maybe a little afraid of a client, and I've always um, struggled with representation because I don't have a problem representing them. I'm not going to meet with them privately, you know, uh, because of safety concerns. But I've always struggled with that because I don't mind representing them, but I also don't want to get hurt. Okay, so the question for the tape is, you know, what happens when a lawyer has concerns about personal safety in representing a client, and it isn't that there's any philosophical objection to representing the client, but rather, you know, an issue relating to whether there's there that the representation presents a safety concern. You know, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of ethics rules that address that situation. And um, as we know through the media, there are times when clients, and especially clients who may have mental health problems, do present a danger to others, um, whether it's their own lawyer or courtroom personnel or judge, whatever. And you, I think it's appropriate to take steps to ensure your safety. Um, and so talking generally about attorney-client privilege. Uh, well, generally what I've done is just, I don't meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and that generally has been enough, but it, it's something I always think about. Well, that's kind of where I was going. You know, you are permitted to have someone with you when you're meeting with a client only if you do it in such a way that that person is also covered by attorney-client privilege. So, you know, you, you're going to want to take some care in deciding who it is who's going to be present with you if you have safety concerns in your meeting with the client. You know, if it's another lawyer or personnel in your office, that's perfectly fine. If you go outside of that professional setting and you bring in somebody from the outside, you may have some problems. So you just want to be careful on that. 
And speaking about that issue, you also want to be careful if the client wants to bring somebody with them, which sometimes happens, the, 